The Martian by Andy Weir. Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. The Celestine Prophecy by James Redfield. Milk and Honey by Rupee Kaur. All these works of literature are now quite well known, some on the border of being cultural phenomena. Despite their disparate subject matter, all four of these works intersect at a meaningful point. They were all initially self-published. These, along with a plethora of other success stories, serve as inspiration for a multitude of aspiring authors who have chosen to self-publish their work. Our podcast, Homespun Script, is dedicated to telling their stories, talking with them about their work, and listening to their experiences as self-published authors. The goal is simple. Provide indie and self-published authors with a platform to promote themselves and their work. While providing this space hopefully does help, we encourage all our listeners to further support these authors by writing positive and engaging reviews of their work on a platform we all know of but will remain nameless. Doing so is a simple, easy, and direct way of supporting them. And now, on to our guest. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Homespun Script. My guest today is Charles House, author of the science fiction novel, Archblade, Legend of the Defiler. Published in 2023, Archblade initiates the story of the crew of the exploratory spaceship Forerunner. Drawn in and trapped on an unfamiliar planet by an inexplicable gravitational field, the crew of the Forerunner find themselves caught in the middle of a complicated political tapestry amongst a hauntingly familiar local population. As they navigate this unfamiliar territory, the crew discover not only more about themselves as individuals, but also about their past and their scientific understanding of the world. So, Charles, you self-published Archblade in 2023, which I think I can safely describe as a rather adept blend of science fiction and fantasy. Due to the number of seemingly diverse ideas you fluidly weave together here, it strikes me as a project that was long in the making. Can you tell us maybe a bit about yourself and how the book came to be? Uh, well, I've, I've loved reading ever since I was a kid. And um, when I was fifth grade, they had uh, writing projects. And I loved reading and I wanted to craft my own story. So I jumped right into that. And I was drawn in by fantasy, science fiction, horror, all those elements. And my, my fifth grade teacher on probably the best of my projects actually said that someday we will see books of his on shelves. And that, that just inspired me. And that's that a great on, inspiration. Yeah. 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 I just, I wanted to write from that point on. Um, <laughs> unfortunately I spent years trying to come up with something that worked. And at the very beginning it was basic. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't terribly unique. But over the years, I added things, changed things, and after after about twenty five years, I finally found something that you know made it work. <laughs> okay, and the result of this was Archblade, I assume. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, great. Um, one interesting thing is um, about three years ago, I was talking to my wife about writing because she was interested in writing a book, and she was feeling really insecure about trying to come up with something, and so I told her about my idea. And I just randomly off the cuff said, hey, let's make it a science fiction fantasy blend. And that made it all snap into place. It, it, it worked and it felt good in my brain. And I started writing it and, you know, it took off. It actually became a story. Oh, okay. So did you write it kind of like a seat of the pants sort of thing? Or did you outline the whole plot beforehand? I, I, uh, I, I had an outline, a very rough outline. but. A, a lot of things developed as I wrote. And I mean, I, I would definitely consider myself more of a plotter because there's, you know, plotters versus pantsers. But mm -hmm. um, some things come to mind, isn't it right? But I, I definitely think I plot more than anything. Yeah, I hear you there. Everything I do is centered around organization and planning things out. Hmm. But so, um, yeah, you mentioned that you got interested in science fiction, fantasy, and horror in fifth grade. That's quite a while ago. And these ideas have been percolating for 25 years. Um, can you remember the first thing you wrote that uh, got your teacher's attention? Oh, my gosh. 
Um, I wrote this god awful horror story for a Halloween project about this box of evil little little fidgets, little things that people would say, "Oh, that looks yummy," and I'll try to eat it, and they turn into a monster. And this guy eats one, and he turns into what was a blatant ripoff of Crash Man from Mega Man Two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was it was terrible honestly i mean i had all these these silly like cliche ideas and i i mean i was proud of it at the time but bless my teacher's heart he was like you know what you can do better i bet if you take the time to really put your heart into it you can do better and then um i wrote two other stories that, again, were blatant ripoffs of other things I've seen, but they were much better. Yeah, it's hard, I think, at that age especially to not have things that at least borrow substantially from what you've already read. But also, when you say like crazy ideas here and crazy ideas there, I would think the imagination of a fifth grader might go off in kind of really interesting directions every so often. Interesting um, is definitely the word for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, yeah, getting back to Archblade, it seems that um, – so have many of these ideas that are present in the book, have they been percolating all this time or was it more like the energy that was percolating and it just all of a sudden burst out for you? Well, the original concept of of the male main character and the main, uh, the main um, antagonist, those were always present. Mm-hmm. And um, – I had a real, I had this weird interest in necromancy and undead and zombies and monsters like that from a young age. So that was always a big thing too. So it was always like the hero fighting an army of the undead. That that's how everything started. And of course, you know, I was a young boy and I was interested in girls. So there's the whole rescuing the damsel and she falls into them too. You know, mm-hmm. that was the the basic thing that's always been a part of it. Okay. And then other elements just got added as time went on. Cool. Yeah. Are you a Dungeons and Dragons guy or not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've lost a few friends recently to the um, digital heroine that is Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, I love that game. What am I, um, when you were talking about uh, the actors, about what you want to do later, one of which is an a- voice actor from Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, cool. Yes. Awesome. Well, let's leave that because I, I didn't choose any of the voice actors from Baldur's Gate 3, but I think a couple of them would fit fairly well into your novel. Oh, they're, they're so good. <laughs> yeah, they really are. But anyway, let's get, um, let's get maybe to the, the plot of the book a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Archblade, at least in the title, sounds very much like an action-oriented science fiction fantasy novel. Um, as I read it, though, I realized it's much, much more than that, because there are all kinds of ethical and philosophical obstacles that are encountered by the crew of the Forerunner that might be even more complicated and problematic than the military and logistical issues they face. Since there are quite a few of these, maybe we could talk about one or two of them and we can go from there. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that was really big to me was about a child worrying about inheriting the sins of their parents oh. and worrying about becoming them. That, that, that's something that's always resonated with me because um, oh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but let's just say my biological father wasn't the greatest guy in the world and I look just like him and I spent years trying to have a good relationship with him. And after I saw how he wasn't such a great person, I became terrified of being, becoming that person. So that theme that's in my book about, you know, the Lark worrying about, you know, his heritage and the kind of person he's going to become, that's very much personal to me. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I can definitely um, see a mirror there. Yeah. Um, another one, and honestly, this one I just kind of stumbled upon, um, the part where they in the flashback, when they're talking about um, the character Lissa how she was impregnated against her will and she was resolute in saying, I'm keeping this baby. I don't care if like everybody in the kingdom is telling me I should get rid of it. This is mine. I will keep it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where I didn't mean to have that kind of thing. But at the same time with the way the story unfolded, I realized that 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 was going to be unavoidable. So, Mm -hmm. 
you know, I wanted to make it clear that I'm not trying to invite any kind of debate about, you know, pro-choice or pro-life, but it's, you know, she had her child, she was keeping it, and that was it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't really see that as a, um, bringing up the issue of pro-life or pro-choice. I saw it mainly as a reflection of the issue that you just mentioned, which is whether we inherit the sins or inherit um, maybe the disposition of our parents in some way. And I saw Lark struggling with this later in the book when he says something like, your abilities don't define you, your choices do. Yeah. Um, actually, I had a couple of beta readers point out the whole pro-choice thing more than oh. anything. So okay. I, I, cl- I, I, I kind of changed that scene to try to reflect that better. But yeah, I mean, at first I didn't see it as much either, but I had people point it out and they're like, okay, yeah, you have a point. So <laughs> yeah, I suppose um, it, you can find it in there, but yeah, it, I, it didn't even occur to me when I read it. <laughs> that's okay. I yeah. mean, that's a great thing about these books. I mean, you look at it differently, different people find different issues. It's, it's why I love this stuff. Yeah. I think it's a mark of good literature when it um, sparks a different discussion or different thought pattern in different readers in oh, yeah, perfectly I, legitimate ways. I agree entirely. Um, let's see. I could see another good example. Oh, um, later on when uh, Angel is really pressuring the Treekin to join a battle that they very much didn't want to be a part of, mm. you know, it's that it's that ethical conundrum. It's like you know, this is in your best interest, but at the same time, you know, pressuring and forcing. That was really tricky for me, trying to you know, sculpt that scene in a way that made it seem like, you know, neither side is being particularly unreasonable because right. yeah, I could see it's easy for someone to take side in an issue like that. So, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully I did it right, but I, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Yeah. That scene was really good. I actually have a note in here about it, but it, we see almost a personality change in Angel at that point, because at one point at the beginning of the story, she's kind of reserved and she's this very intelligent scientist. And then all of a sudden there's this ethical issue she confronts and she says to herself, I know this is the right thing to do. And it's like her personality changes all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I put a lot of work into her character growth through the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was, that was some well-crafted dialogue there. It moved really well, I thought. Thank you. Also tell my wife you said that actually, because I mean, she is, she, she helps so much with that character for me. Yeah. There's, um, there's a long history of male, uh, science fiction authors writing female characters very poorly. And all (laughs) we have to do is look at Robert Heinlein for that is his female (laughs) characters are abysmal. (laughs) Well, the the way he writes them is abysmal. Yeah. No, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, when I was first writing and I was looking into broader spaces about tips, fellow authors and whatnot. One of the first things I saw is men writing women and how it's been done terribly in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so I resolved to not be one of those. <laughs> yeah, well, we have an uphill battle there, I think. But I, yeah, I thought you wrote Angel very well. She was, she, it was a very strong character. And Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's talk about this neutrality directive. Um, I, I have it capitalized here, and I think you mentioned it once or twice, but it wasn't capitalized in the book, so I might be imposing a name for it. Uh, you know, I didn't give it a name. It was okay. just, you know, this is our law. We don't interfere. And, okay. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's different than what you see. You may see in other science fiction mediums because usually it's about not interfering with lesser developed cultures, which obviously doesn't apply here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But for them, it's more about just political and military. And yeah, that that was fun because I had I had to come up with like I didn't want them to join the fight at the start. I wanted to create some some tension and a bit of drama with the subject. But at the same time, there's this no brainer thing. It's like any reasonable person may think, obviously, you should fight. It's a terrible idea if you don't. So Building up to them making that decision was something I really had to carefully do. Yeah, I saw that as well because it took a lot for the crew of the Forerunner to sort of officially get involved in the whole military situation there. It took actually a couple skirmishes that they were involved in. And I think it even 
some of their crew members were kidnapped at one point, and it was only after that. Yeah, that was the they, tipping point. Okay, that, that was, was the when they point. realized, okay, they're not going to leave us alone. We don't have we. It, they're they're kind of pushing it so we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some would even say that they could have justified being involved from the very beginning because they were forcefully dragged to the planet by the the gravitational field, which I assume was from the conclave, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think they may have been justified right off the bat, but yeah, they were very careful in the way they rationalized the whole thing. Well, one thing. I mean, I agree with you, honestly. I mean, if I if I was sure. know, like an objective reader reading this, I would have been like, yeah, why didn't they just join from the start? But mm -hmm. um, I think one important lens is that there's a lot of hints about their own conflict back home yeah. and how they're trying to get support in one way or the other. So they're walking that fine line between we want help for our own problems, but at the same time, we have to deal with this and, you know, the clash of dealing with both of those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they kind of realize you're, well, I don't want to give too much up, but it, it happens fairly, you realize this fairly quickly. So I don't think I'm giving away a spoiler here, but yeah. they realize very quickly that in order to get the new technology they're looking for to aid in their conflict back home, they're going to have to get involved in the conflict on this planet. And they're, they're not, they can't come in, grab what they need and run out like the whole planet's a burning house. Exactly. You brought up a point earlier. I want to go back to it. How the and when I when I saw them doing when I saw the rationalizations happening, um, obviously everyone's going to think this. We're going to think Prime Directive from Star Trek. Oh, and definitely. Yeah. And I like how you distinguish what I'm calling the neutrality directive from the Prime Directive. And you said that the Prime Directive um, indicates that we shouldn't, or explorers shouldn't interfere with the natural evolutionary development or technological development in order to give one side of a political conflict a, an advantage over the other. And yeah, you're, you're right. This, this was very different because in terms of technology, their technology is completely different. And the way they do things is different. The way they think is, is different. Um, let's maybe segue into that a little bit. Uh, there's some of what is generally termed hard science fiction in your novel. And I'm referring specifically to the intersection of magic and technology, which runs throughout the plot. Um, can you maybe describe your approach and take on this theme? Well, um, I've watched science fiction ever since I was a kid. Like, my, my, in my house, we watched Star Trek. You know, it was the altar in which we watched television. Um, so... Having accurate scientific, you know, information and references was a big deal for me because to me that that aids immersion and enjoyment when you think to yourself, this could actually happen. So I really wanted to incorporate that in my writing to try to give that same sense. I, I, I found like in some science fiction that, you know, if you have too many sci con scientific concepts that are supposed to be taken on faith without any real expl explanation, mm. you know, it, it, it can break the immersion. Like, I mean, like, for example, one of my favorite shows is Stargate SG-1. Mm. I'm, you're probably familiar with it to some extent. Yep. But one thing that always bucked the crap out of me of that show is everybody spoke English, and they never explained that. <laughs> and it just drove, drives me nuts. I mean, I'll still watch the show. I like it a lot. Yeah. But I just, it, it, my brain can't get past that. Yeah. And even one of the more interesting things that's been done in science fiction, and this is uh, even in the early 20th century, there are a few short stories, but encountering an alien species that thinks so differently that using the same language just doesn't work. Yeah. Because, and um, I'm, I'm, I guess the most recent one would be oh, uh, the book, the movie um, Arrival was patterned after it. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. It's a short story. I, not by Ken. I can't remember the author's name. It's going to drive me crazy now, but it's a very good short story. But the language is so different that it conveys a literally a different thought pattern. And oh, that's that's interesting. I, mm -hmm. I like that a lot. But 
I'm not going to give any spoilers here. You, you have a perfectly good explanation for why it all works here. But yeah, yeah let's go back to this intersection of magic and technology. Um, that was pretty cool because you have the people on the planet using what's on, on the um, the local people on the planet using what we would call magic and using gestures to make things happen. Whereas the crew of the Forerunner uses definitely what we would call technology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I really wanted things to be simple and absorbable by the reader. Like one big approach I had with magic is I just, it was just a matter of channeling elemental forces to do things. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a matter of having a different set of spells that can make things levitate or change something into something else. I want it to be, mm-hmm. you know, simple. I mean, obviously that concept is broken a little bit with, you know, essence and entropy magic doing more expanded things, but um, that simple approach, you know, makes the intersection of magic and technology that much easier. Mm-hmm. And, it, I think it all came off pretty pretty well. <laughs> yeah, it did. And w- what really interested me about it is that they're dealing with kind of the same physical reality. And you know, the, the laws of physics don't really change when they land on the planet. It's just that they're being accessed in a different way by the crew of the Forerunner and the local population. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I went to extreme lengths to try to you know, make things as believable as possible. I had, I had two amazing references for this book. Mm-hmm. I have a brother who has a degree in microbiology, who is probably the smartest person I know, and he's a font of scientific information. So whenever I had anything I was doubting about a concept, I would talk to my brother and say, hey, is this feasible? Is this believable? And a lot of times the answer was yes, so that helped. And then anything involving anatomy or medical information, wounds, medical care, my wife is a nurse, so she was invaluable for that. She she helped a lot of scenes that involved, you know, medical stuff and anatomy. Did it involve the, the people getting cut up and all the gore and the violence yes. that happened? Yeah, because that was yes. pretty detailed as well and very she, very convincing and had a pretty big impact on me. She was she was really great about that. Cool. So yeah, it reminds me of um, I think when we were discussing this before a little bit, uh, that phrase of Arthur C. Clarke where he says something along the lines of yeah about sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic (laughs) sounds good yeah yeah i know what you mean about you know magic just being science that we don't understand yet Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. and i'm I'm sure he wasn't arthur c clark wasn't the first one to think that way but his articulation of it certainly got popularized oh yeah absolutely yeah So um, let's talk about a few of the main characters without, of course, spoiling any of the plot. Let's start with the operation and then move to the anesthetic. There are two villains, both of whom are quite different from one another. Why did he choose to have two villains and why so different? Well, they represent what I consider to be the two best types of villains. I mean, on one hand, you've got the evil, sadistic, no empathy, no remorse, no chance of redemption. That's the kind of evil villain that's not terribly complicated, but at the same time, they do such terrible things. You love to hate them, and you get so much satisfaction from seeing them fall. My my, my golden example of a villain like that would be um, Kefka from Final Fantasy VI. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar, but there's some of your listeners maybe, but he is the perfect epitome of the irredeemable evil villain um and then on the other side is the methodical complicated wounded the kind that believes what they're doing is right you know the kind of thing that the reader might actually sympathize with them a little bit mm-hmm. and then a good example of that is loki from the uh mcu okay um i really liked having both of them because i felt that they complemented each other and giving the reader a split perspective on the kind of threats that the main cast faces. I Mm. mean, the complex villain is the final encounter of the book, but the sadist, the the one that's, you know, kind of crazy, he's often the clear and present threat that's more scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this this is Adora, 
Um, yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah, he. I, I never detected anything like a moral conscience or anything like empathy from him. It was all very mechanical and actually taking joy in the suffering of others, yeah. or if you even call that joy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when you when the brain is that twisted, it's hard to really say. I was hoping he would die. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I agree. Uh, Darkos is a lot more complicated, even though he's Adura's boss. Um, you could maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, um, he, oh God, I, I, you know, I'm trying to do this without going into spoiler territory because the problem mm. with Darkos is I'm planning a prequel book oh, okay. that talks about him and everything that led to his fall. And, you know, I, I, I mean, the, when, I, when I wrote him as a character, one thing that was really nice is my wife said, I love this character. I want to know more about him. Maybe we should try to write more of a story about him. And and then, of course, I go online and I find out that people love complicated villains. They love sympathetic villains. Mm -hmm. And that was great because, I mean, I loved him as a character too. But um, as far as the kind of person he is, I mean, he has a unique, organized mind. He, you know, he has a lot of you know, negativity, he's got a lot of anger and, you know, hatred, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of like this cool, you know, planned out kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I might be doing a terrible job describing it, but like I said, I'm trying to avoid spoilers. So, right. Yeah. And if I'm a little bit on the borderline of a spoiler here, just let me know and I'll stop talking. But I got a big foreshadow of the complexity of that character when and well, we all know this is going to happen. Darkos gets in a big fight with Lark. That there's no secret there. But at one point, he says, "I am a necessary evil." Yeah. And I thought, okay, there's something a lot more going on with this guy. He's not just some evil D and D necromancer who thinks, "Hey, death is cool. I'm going to raise yeah. the dead and get more power." <laughs> but there's more to this guy. And the fact that you said, "I have a prequel plan that goes into Darkos," makes a lot of sense right now. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to writing that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I also got the intention that do you think Darkos is kind of beyond redemption or not? <laughs> you see that I you see that's that's a hard one to answer. Okay. I've got you don't answer it if it's gonna give away spoilers, but I, I think that's open interpret to interpretation even as the book progresses. It's one of those things where if you're in in my opinion. I mean, this is this is more about the topic of morality, but my mm -hmm. opinion is that if your intentions start out as good, and if you're willing to take a moment to say, I was wrong, then there's always a chance of redemption. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to make that change and to admit fault, mm -hmm. I think there's always a chance of redemption. It's a tough one because I kind of see, or at least I'm speculating on Darko's past, that he's always trying to do the right thing or he at one point he was trying to do the right thing and then he just got forced into this cycle or this everything snowballed and the means that he were he was using to try and accomplish this goal which what may have been a noble goal just spun way out of control and so he's almost a victim of circumstance in a strange way and maybe Lark is trying to avoid being that same sort of victim of circumstance that Darko succumbed to. Oh, yeah. Or maybe yeah. didn't even have a choice to succumb to. Yeah, because th that goes back to what you said about choice. Mm -hmm. It's about making choice about who you are and not letting everything else make that choice for you. Yeah. And There's... Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm so delighted that you inferred all this from Darko's character because... <laughs> Oh, he's, he's my favorite character. Yeah. He's he's so important to to this book, and it's going to be, and his importance is going to branch out into other books. Awesome. And you know, being be, with this being my first book, you know, I can't help but have a lot of self doubt about me doing things right. But you inferring all this from this character, I'm going, yes, I did it. This is good, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I just want more. I want more Darkos, man. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, let's see. Let's revisit this phrase that a, that Lark uses a lot. Um, you do, your abilities don't define who you are. Your choices do. We can almost read that as your lineage doesn't define who you are. Your choices do, or your background doesn't define who you are. Your choices do. 
Yeah. I mean, and there's a, no, okay. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. There's a lot, con- there's a lot contained in there. Oh yeah. Very much so. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be aimed to put his mind at rest because it's, I mean, Angel says that to him to, to start with. And it's supposed to help him see that he's more than the circumstances of his birth. Mm-hmm. And he's more than what his father planned for him. He's more than, you know, the way he was raised and that the choices he makes. And, you know, this is, this is kind of dumb because I'm trying to avoid mm-hmm. being a carbon copy of that quote from the Pokemon movie, you know? Oh. You know what I'm talking about? I don't actually. There, it's this iconic line. There's this iconic line at the end where Mewtwo goes, I see now that circumstances of one birth are is irrelevant, but what you do with the choice of life is what matters. So oh, okay. it's the same spirit for sure, but I was trying to like make it more. It's like, it's not just about birth. It's also about the circumstances of your life mm-hmm. afterwards. That oh, yeah. And, and I think that's the point that Lark embodies that in a lot of ways. Uh, why don't we move on to the anesthetic then? Uh, your two protagonists. Mm-hmm. Let's start with Angel. Um, maybe describe her as best you can without giving anything away and say a bit on how you approached her experience of anxiety in like such a relatable way. Which, I, as an aside, I thought you did that quite well. Thank you. Um, well, to be blatantly honest, Angel's complexity and the way her anxiety portrayed is 100% because of my wife. I mean, I... Um, shamelessly, I based Angel on her in a lot of ways. I mean, my mm-hmm. wife is one of the smartest people I know. She loves books. She has a very analytical, scientific mind. But she's had problems with anxiety her whole life. So, you know, whenever there was a part of the book where Angel's anxiety would really crop up and get in the way or maybe even cripple her, I would always run it by my wife, say, here, help me describe this in a way that somebody with these problems would understand because i mean i know anxiety is such a common problem in our society today yeah for a myriad of reasons you know even if it's not pathological circumstantial is definitely a thing Mm -hmm. so you know i want people to read this and go i've been there i know what that's like and i think my wife oh she did such a good job helping me with that very cool yeah, well, not cool that your wife has anxiety, but cool that <laughs> everything worked that way to make the the character of of Angel seem a lot more human and yeah. not cookie cutter at, at all. Yeah, I thought she was done very well. And you know, as I said before, I love the scene where she her whole personality almost changes in the oh, yeah. diplomatic relations with the tree kin. Like, whoa, where would that come from? Yeah, that was a real like pinnacle of her growth as a character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope we see more of her too. So let's move on to Lark. Um, the character Lark is a different face of a multifaceted die of human personality. And I'll admit when he entered the picture, he struck me as kind of dangerously close to a Mary Sue type. But as you developed him, it became very evident that he is not a Mary Sue. Uh, can you maybe talk a bit about your thought process uh, in this character development? Well, um, I'll be honest. I mean, when I was first imagining the story as a, as a, as a teenager, he was absolutely that kind of character. He, you know, he was a dashing hero with no flaws who always kept his cool and always won the day single handedly. But, you know, as I expanded my worldview and I read more books and I, you know, I, I saw the value in having flawed characters that were more real and more human. He evolved as a character, too. I mean, my first, my very first draft of this book actually still had many of those problems. Um, I think the most important change is when I decided to have to make Angel a second protagonist rather than just a supporting character, mm-hmm. giving her more time in the story and being the guiding force behind many of the important events that allowed Lark to have more vulnerable abilities, vul- vulnerabilities, and gave her more of a chance to shine, her, shine herself. So, you know. Doing so with that duality between the two characters, it allowed you know more flaws and more ways for them to complement each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw Lark. He's this amazing warrior, and as a warrior and as a fighter, he doesn't have a whole lot in terms of flaws. But when it comes to 
social interactions. He's really not not that good. He's kind of immature. Yeah. And yeah, that that comes out a little bit later. So when he visits um like the the stone giants and um the the ravagers and the tree kin, everyone respects him as a warrior. But when diplomatic relationships come in, he kind of backs off and doesn't really know what to do. You know, it that's that there's a couple there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one is that, you know, he's definitely an apt. You know, he's very much the mindset I just people tell me to kill things and that's what I'm good at. So I focus on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also, you know, he has to deal with um, a legacy that haunts him about how they talk about the races unifying to fight the conclave. And that legacy kind of it fell on his shoulders and it's something he oh, dreams right. of. But the pressure and, you know, everything else going on, he just he kind of cracks under it. Yeah, it looks. Yeah, when you said that, this whole idea of Lark being scared that he's just going to fall into this, uh, like unavoidably fall into the same mindset or trap that um, his father did, it, it becomes a little bit more apparent now. So let's also talk about his interpersonal relationships are a little bit are a little bit um, a little bit off as well, and this is understandable in a way because he is. I don't want to say well, he's definitely not exiled, but He's sort of an outcast within his own population due to his lineage. And you can see that in the way he talks with other people, particularly Angel at first. Oh, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> part of that is um, it's it's a lot of it's my own experience, actually. I mean, when I was growing up in high school, I was the weird kid. So, you know, I would often sit by myself. I had a very small number of friends and I valued any social interaction I could get. So, but at the same time, I was socially inept. So, whenever I did have social interactions, they would be very awkward and kind of forced and, you know, not great. So, that helped a lot with developing mm-hmm. him and the way he interacted with people. But I think that as the story goes on and he goes from being this place that, you know, he's an outcast to a place where, oh, these people actually, you know, accept me and, these things that are a big deal back home aren't a big deal here. He kind of gets into a comfort zone and he gets better about interacting with them. I did see that. Yeah. It's almost as though when he starts socializing with the crew of the forerunner, he gets like a social reboot. It's like when you're in middle school or high school and you go to summer camp and you're around a whole bunch of different people that you've never seen before. And it's like a social reboot or even going to college. Well, that's a great way to put it. I love that. All right, um, let's let's move on. Uh, there are a few moments in the novel which struck me as particularly enjoyable. And before introducing these, um, I'd like to know which parts of the novel you find mo- you most enjoyed writing, or m- moments that you're particularly proud of. Well, um, there's one scene that I love, and that's this. I actually started the entire book by writing this scene. You know, when I was first planning things, I wasn't entirely sure I'd actually get it down on paper, but I came up with this scene. And I loved it so much. I told myself, if there is any chance I'm going to write this book, I need to write this scene down so I don't forget it. And that's the parts where they're in Caesarea and there are these unjust laws that are forced. And, you know, rather than being a good soldier and following orders, he's like, no, I refuse. I will not do this. I don't care what the consequences are. I refuse to take part in this because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the part when he's in the main hall and they're refusing to aid the Stonekin and he sees this as a blatant violation of the oath he took. Mm-hmm. And that oath is to defend innocent people. Just, you know, it's just very simple. You defend the innocent. It's, 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 it's simple. But yet this whole thing is making it political. It's like, oh, no, they're not part of us, so we shouldn't help them. The treaty expired. We need to renegotiate. And he's like, no, screw that. We help innocent people. That's the end of it. And yeah, there's not a whole lot of room for interpretation there. And it seems like the bureaucracy is getting in the way. And we find out later why the bureaucracy is getting oh, yeah, in the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I enjoyed, you know, developing that story. But, you know, just making it clear about, you know, his sense of right and wrong and how he was willing to declare it in a room full of people, regardless of the consequences, and just you know, going off, going off and willing to do the right thing, even he, though he was alone, even though he'd probably fail, 
it didn't matter because he cared so much about what doing what was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one, it's a situation where not being a, an experienced diplomat actually worked in his favor. It yeah, in everybody's that's true. favor. Yeah, I like that scene as well. It was pretty early on, I think. Yeah, it was fairly early on. Oh yeah, so. it's like in uh -huh. the first like twenty to twenty five percent of the book, I think. Mm -hmm. So there are a few that I really liked, um, and these are kind of specific, and I don't think any are really integral to the plot in a way that will reveal too much. They're just they're what I thought were really cool ideas. So first. The scene is fairly early on where Lark and the crew of the Forerunner are gathering wood in arm loads to power the spaceship. <laughs> yeah. Which, and the mental image I got there was pretty awesome, which is, you know, a bunch of people carrying logs of wood and tossing them in a wood burning stove and like, oh, that powers the spaceship. But, you know, of <laughs> course that's not the case. And I thought it was a really interesting idea that you had there, which works in um, the idea of using natural resources in a really a very efficient way because the wood that they're using is nutrient rich and they use kelp and other organic material to power the spaceship, which intuitively doesn't seem as though it's possible. But if they're extracting the resources and extracting the nutrients in a highly efficient way, well, we just have transference of energy when you get right down to it. Yeah. Um, the concept was actually inspired by a game called Subnautica. Oh, and cool. in that game, you get a bioreactor that you get hours upon hours of power by just, you know, shoving some plant matter in there. And mm -hmm. I, I, I love that concept. I mean, it made things convenient and it seemed like a good inspiration for a power source. But I mean, more than that, it's it's an optimistic fantasy, you know, of fuel so so simple, so easy that just a large amount of power can be granted from just a relatively small source. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is one of those things where I where I consulted my brother on and I said, hey, do you think technology could ever advance to the point that we could use organic matter and in such an efficient way to actually get a large amount of power? And he spent like 30 minutes explaining it. But the answer eventually was <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, awesome. Yeah, that's a relief to know. You know, well, the very idea is um, not only optimistic, but I, I really like that idea. That was one of my favorite scenes. And the, the whole concept in general that you had there, I really liked. Uh, the next one, I think it's a little over halfway through, but I think it's Reynard, who's the tactical officer of the yeah. Forerunner. Uh, he's managing the helm. It's at one of those points where he's completely exhausted and he hears someone approaching from the approaching the bridge. And from the cadence of the footsteps, he figures out it's Bastion, who's a, a, the scholar of the group, who's approaching. Mm -hmm. And without even turning around, um, Renard says, what do you need, Bastion? And Bastion is surprised and impressed that Renard figured this out, to which Renard says, call it sixth sense. And <laughs> there's a very, well, maybe it's not so subtle, but you kind of work it in really well. There are two reasoning processes going on there because Renard actually figures out who it was through a not so complex series of, you know, deductive syllogisms. Okay, the case, it can't be this person because this person's not on duty right now. The footstep, the cadence of the footsteps is too long to be this person. So I'm going to deduce that it has to be Bastion. And there's a logical process that goes along with it. And then he just throws out, oh yeah, it was sixth sense, mm -hmm. which sixth sense gives intimations of magic, but the deductive process gives intimations of technology. And I thought that was a neat little contrast you drew there. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, um, you can thank my wife for that one because I wanted a uh, quote unquote non protagonist scene, you know, just with the crew without Lark and Angel to mm -hmm. pad out that part of the book. And she came up with the clever idea of showing off Reynard's keen mind in that uh, regard. I also, I really liked showing little things here and there that made each character unique in a non magical way. That would still be awe-inducing to the reader, like Lauren being able to operate on only a couple hours of sleep. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that seems magical in itself. Sure. Um, Akron's ability to command and adapt to an entirely alien world, alien threats, and he just handles it so well. Mm -hmm. And there are other things I actually have planned in future books to show off what other characters can do as well. Cool. Yeah, it's small things like that that give, I, I don't want to call them minor characters, but they give these characters who aren't the protagonists and antagonists, they give them a sense of personality that extends beyond just being placeholders for performing a certain role. I'm glad it came off that way. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> cool. 
So the last one I really liked was uh, regarding the Treekin and their bonded riders. At one point, I think it's either Maya or Reynard comments about their mounts saying, those big rabbits, how effective are they in a fight? And uh, that brought to mind a rather amusing image of a battle bunny. But again, as he developed the idea, it totally made sense because it, the I, I'm guessing you consulted your brother on this one as well, on the, the uh, mechanical biology of a rabbit and how strong their hind legs are. Oh, yeah. And if, you know, bred and large enough, they could probably kick over a tank and they they kick the heck out of some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I had some sort of deep or complex answer for this, but the truth is, I just think rabbits are extremely cute. I, I, my heart just gets all fuzzy for them. And <clears throat> when I was, you know, planning the tree kin and who they are and what they do, I wanted a non-traditional animal companion because in so many books you see that they have wolves or elk or bears. And I wanted something completely different. And since this was mm -hmm. an alien world, you could play with biology all you wanted. So sure. as a random idea, I randomly came up with, what about giant rabbits? And the more I thought about it, the more I enjoyed it and the more it made sense. Yeah, it does work. That's what's awesome about it. So when can we expect a sequel? Well, um, I'm well into the first draft of the sequel, Oathbound. I'm not sure how long that's going to take to finish everything. But mm -hmm. hopefully within a year or two. Um, I'm also starting some scenes for the third book. And I've been working on outlines for the rest. I'm planning a seven book series. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, it's like I know for a fact I've got three. I, I'm going to do three for sure. Mm -hmm. Then I'll see how things go. And then I have an outline for four books after that. And then there was the standalone prequel I mentioned before. So okay. I guess a total of eight books. Well, if you want my input, I want to read the prequel. <laughs> but well, I'll, be, I'll be happy with the sequel for now. Yeah, I, I'm planning on doing the prequel probably after the third book because there's going to be like a rather large time jump between the third and fourth books. So mm -hmm. having the prequel as like a, a like an in-between, I think, would work really well. So let's move to the final question, one we both prepared for. Yeah. And yeah, I, this, this cracked me up as I was preparing for it as well. But the novel seems as though it would lend itself very well to more motion picture format. And this happened at the point where I started contemplating different actors in some of the more prominent roles. So I listed six of the more primary characters, and we each had a homework assignment to figure out what actor or actress would be best suited to each of these roles. So let's take yep. turns on this one. Um, let's start with Angel. Who did you okay. have playing Angel? <clears throat> well, um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, this group. They call themselves Viva La Dirtly. They, um, they have videos on YouTube. They do all this comedy stuff about D&D &D and World of Warcraft. And one of their regular actors is a woman named Britt Scott Clark. She's mm -hmm. um, she's the right age. She's blonde, which works. And she's got a wonderful range. I've seen her play roles where she's this shy little introverted nerd. But at the same time, I've seen her play roles where she's this strong, you know, forward thinking, you know, gamer that gives a middle finger to, you know, male stereotypes in gaming. Mm -hmm. And I it just I, I, I like it didn't even occur to me. My 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 wife randomly suggested that. And I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Well, Angel wears several different faces, so that would fit. I chose Sersha Ronan, who is she's the actress who was the protagonist in the movie Lady Bird. Okay. And Ooh, one moment to look that up. Okay. I think she's the. Well, how old did you envision Angel? Ah, uh, mid twenties. I think I actually have a character okay. profile that has her as like twenty four or twenty five or something like that. Okay. The age would fit here then. Yeah. yeah. But she's an Irish actress and she did a fantastic job with Lady Bird. Oh. And it was just a coming to coming of age movie. I think it was nominated for an Academy Award maybe four or five years ago. Yeah, I thought she would be quite good there. Yeah. She she definitely looks the part for sure. All right. Idura. I'm gonna ah. go first on Adura. Go um for it. yeah, I was a little bit troubled when you said that Loki reminded you of Darkos because I chose Tom Hiddleston as a good Adura, but you hey, have that, to dye his hair blonde. That still works. I mean, 
Tom Hiddleston's got range. I mean, through all the different places we've seen Loki, we've seen mm-hmm. that the guy can be psychotic and unhinged, but yet methodical and careful. And he's really good about going between those two points. So that's yeah. that's still a really good choice, I think. Yeah. And Loki's a wildly multidimensional character. And um, Adur is pretty straightforward, but I think Hiddleston just has that evil look or has the potential to get that evil look in his face and that that's that evil look is what I pictured when I oh. pictured Adura. And he's handsome, so that helps because Adura mm-hmm. comes off as this handsome, unopposing guy. Yeah, kind um, of a Ken doll, an evil Ken doll. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I went with Neil Newborn. He's okay. the voice actor for Asterion in Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, good call. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I love him as a voice actor. The first time I saw him is when he voiced Heisenberg from Resident Evil 8. Mm-hmm. And... I love both of those characters so much. And one thing they both have in common is that they're really good about being articulate and even keeled and convincing and charismatic. But yet when push comes to shove, they're really good about coming off as evil and psychotic. And Mm -hmm. oh my God, my life is at risk here. And I've seen the guys like real pictures. He's, he's a handsome dude. I think he's a natural blonde actually. So that helps too. So I I thought that was a decent choice. Yeah. (laughs) Calm, collected, but very intimidating at the same time. Okay, let's move to Darkos. Um, I actually have, I have a backup choice on this one, oh, so <laughs> just in I. case we. Okay, just in case we chose the same actor, uh, who did you go with? My primary choice is Hugo Weaving. Okay, I did not choose Hugo Weaving. <laughs> I I just I love Hugo Weaving. Every role I've seen him in, he's he's just breathtaking. He's so good at just the you know the evil calm you know inexorable force you know seeing him smith elrond v for Mm -hmm. vendetta actually was a good one because Mm -hmm. that's a morally complex hero and somebody who could do that i think would be a great role for darkos and he's just got that look you know he's got that calm yeah so what was your choice my first choice was alan rickman Oh, and I'm not. I, I'm a little bit hesitant on that one. Just I, I think he was in Harry Potter, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He played yeah. Snape. OK. I, and um, I haven't seen the movies, but um, his look that reminded me of maybe a little bit more evil than in the Harry I, Potter I like movie. that choice. I yeah. like it a lot. OK. So my backup was Ron Perlman, which Ron, would Ron maybe Perlman, be a little really? different. Yeah, a little oh. different. But I'm like, you know, that might be it might work. But he, Ron Perlman might be a little bit too likable. Maybe. I mean, like me, I to me, he represents Hellboy. So mm-hmm. yeah, I just it's hard to imagine him playing Narcos. But at the same time, he's got that older, grizzled kind of fatherly thing about him. Yeah. So that I, you know, that could still work. My it backup actually, my backup, and this is going to get kind of weird, but Liam Neeson. Oh, okay. Seemed like a good choice because. You know, ever since I saw him as Raz Al Ghul in the Batman movies, mm-hmm. I love how the man can play a villain. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, that is, that is a good reference point. He is so good about the way he talks and how, you know, how convincing he can be that makes you go, maybe the bad guy is right. And <laughs> I just, I love that concept about it. And that would fit with Darkos, yeah. his history and personality, I think. Well, maybe not in this book, maybe in the next. We don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on to Lark. Um, I have two choices for Lark as well. Um, how old do you picture Lark? Mid twenties as well. Yeah, about the same age angle. I I couldn't come up with something. I'm gonna be okay. honest. I found one. I found a choice, but I'm not terribly happy with it. So I'm way more interested in what you came up with. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. My first one choice. I'm not. I don't have a first and a second here, but I chose possibly Henry Cavill, who likely is too old for the role. Yeah, but, I I like him. He's yeah. he's not a bad choice, but I I think he is a bit aged out. But I mean, when your mm-hmm. options are limited, I mean, emotionally as an actor, he I think he could definitely nail it. Yeah, the way he played the Witcher, I think, would fit very well with Lark's personality. Definitely. Yeah, my second choice was Tom Sturridge. Tom Sturridge, uh, nothing who familiar is with that one. the he he plays the Sandman in um, the Netflix adaptation of Neil Gaiman's comic book. Oh, yeah. I've heard great things about that, actually. Mm-hmm. And the- a, a very, like, almost unemotional, but very serious, but not in, like, an evil way. And yeah. the look he has there, maybe a little bit less goth, but he's got the black hair, he's skinny, he's well-built. 
And yeah. I, I thought that would work. I thought he would work well there. Oh, yeah, and he's a lot those, younger. He's in those, 20s, those, those choices seem much better than mine. I, I picked Kit Harrington just because, you know, he's kind oh, of young, okay. young looking. He's got dark hair. The mm-hmm. roles I've seen him in kind of work. But, you know, like I said, I wasn't happy with it. Yeah. I could, I could see him. He'd have to change his personality from what he did in Game of Thrones. But yeah, definitely. A different character. That's what actors do. <laughs> okay. Akron. Who do you have for Akron? Oh, Lauren's first. Oh, let's just go with Akron. I have him written down first. Okay. Um, Akron, I went with Keith David. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the guy. Did you ever see Armageddon? No, with, I haven't. Okay. He plays, he's this older guy. Um, he's a, he's a, he's a military general. He's, you know, very, he's very official, very commanding, but he makes wisecracks here and there that make you think, oh, you know, maybe he can, you know, not take things as seriously, but there's a voiceover role. I saw him in recently that was very much not a serious role. And I, it, it really made me change how the guy, you know, approaches acting. And I was thinking, you know what? He could do it. Definitely. Yeah. For this one, um, my choice of actors for this is what shall we say, uh, inspired me to come up with this question, but I had Russell Crowe for Russell Akron. Russell Crowe? Maybe. <laughs> oh, no, I like it. I, just, I like it. I, 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 like I was looking it. at the, I mean, his physique and his facial expressions and the way he looks. That's the way I pictured Akron. Now, Russell Crowe might be a bit too mean or surly for that role, <laughs> in which case I thought George Clooney might also be good, but George Clooney has such a presence that he might just steal the show. I know, I know. I mean, like you see him in anything immediately, you know he is, and it's hard to separate him from his role. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I you know, I like I like Russell Crowe. I mean, I like him. I like him as an actor. You know, I've liked him in the roles I've seen, so that would definitely work. Mm-hmm. Okay, who did you have here? Oh, oh, for for, for Ak- Akron. Oh, it was. Oh, you, no, you said it already. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Um. So Lauren. Lauren. Um. I went with Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Um. Okay. Have you ever seen Scott Pilgrim versus the World? I haven't. Oh, she she plays the main female character. She's really good at this badass i will you know i'll kick ass at a moment's notice if nice if necessary and she's got mm-hmm. you know the fire the passion the intensity and i think just think that'd be a great choice how about mm-hmm. you i had genevieve o'reilly uh mm-hmm. who plays mon mothma in uh, the reboot of the the star wars series on disney and I think it was more more the look she has. And she's a very calm, cool, collected politician there. But she does not put up with crap from anybody. Yeah, and I like that. I like that a lot. Reading about her, yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, this would be a much more aggressive character for her. But I, I think it, she would pull it off pretty well. Oh, that's a good choice. I like your choices a lot. They're a lot they seem okay. really well thought out. I got lucky maybe on a couple of them, and I think I missed the mark on a couple more. But Well, that's okay. I know I missed the mark <laughs> on a couple, so you don't yeah. have to worry about that. <laughs> so um, let's, let's move to maybe something outside the book. Um, you're a self-published author. Um, how did how has this worked out? Um, what's been the process for you? I know it's extremely difficult right now for self-published authors to uh, get their work known, to find a publicist, to do anything that might get their book noticed. Um, what what have you done? What are the problems that you've encountered? What are the good things that you've encountered about it? Uh, it's it's tricky. I mean, when I when I went into it, there's so many things about it. I have no idea. I mean, making the choice between self-publishing and traditional publishing, it's it's there's so much information to make that choice. I mean, traditional publishing can be safer in a lot of ways because a lot of the editing, the marketing is out of your hands and it's a lot less work. But at the same time, you also have to work hard to send out your manuscript to dozens, if not hundreds of sources, trying to Mm -hmm. find an agent, a publisher. And it's hard to find one that will work. I've seen so many stories of people saying, I get, you know, dozens of rejection letters every day. And even if they get accepted, you have to accept that they're probably going to want to change a lot of your book Mm -hmm. because they're going to go with what's marketable or what's what they think will work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to compromise that. I wanted to sell or more specifically, I wanted to get my book out there the way I wanted. I wanted to fail on my own or succeed on my own, if Mm -hmm. the case may be. 
but being a self publisher there's i mean like i mean one one big example is formatting i mean there's so much that you have to do to format your book so that it meets the credentials of whatever distributor you're going to go with i mean i went with amazon mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that the indentations with the wording the spacing the sides of the book um uh the, yeah, the uh, font oh, size. Super it's, interesting technical stuff that I imagine drove you crazy. Oh, it, it really did. Every time I thought I might be done, there were two up more things. I'm like, oh, hey, turns out I still have to do this. And oh. and I even had someone helping me. I had someone helping me that knew the mm -hmm. process, but they just kept coming back saying, oh, we still need to do this. We still need to do that. So I can't imagine trying to do this without you know someone that knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. I'm like the editing process alone. I mean that that's the big cost. Mm -hmm. is editing i mean getting a professional editor for a book this size is like it's like a thousand dollars if you want someone who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. but i just didn't have that money so mm -hmm. i spent a considerable number of days weeks even months editing my book mm -hmm. in one form or another i think it oh. turned out really well given that yeah, it looks as though it's it, it's well edited. I mean, there are no like, spelling errors or weirdness with punctuation that I've seen in other self-published books. I love hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's obvious that you put in a lot of time. You didn't have, to have an editor right there. But yeah, I've read horror stories about people who have a very good novel, but a publisher wouldn't publish it. Like, let's say someone wrote a space opera, but the publisher they're dealing with already published three space operas that year. Yeah. And they don't want to saturate the market with something else within the same genre. And it's very unfortunate that the merit of a book um, has much less impact on its success and um, the way it spreads than we might hope. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, marketing marketing your book is also a big important thing that a lot of people don't realize that you have to do because some people think that, hey, I published my book, it's good, it'll sell, right? I mean, it's good, it must sell. <laughs> but no, no, no. Nobody in the world knows that you've published a book. So you have yeah. to get out there. You have to get on social media. You have to talk about it. You have to promote it. You have to do so without being overly annoying. Otherwise, people will not want to read it. So sure. there's that balance. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, I've gotten on Facebook, on Reddit. I've actually been doing a lot on threads. There's, if, if any, any of your listeners want to try being a writer, threads that the the facebook alternative to twitter has an amazing supportive community for writers and i've discovered that as well yeah yeah it's 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 so nice mm -hmm. well for, for this podcast um i this is an offshoot of another podcast i do and just on a whim i posted on my threads account in that podcast hey would anyone be interested in being in our are there any self-published and indie authors out there? Um, I want to interview you. I'm thinking about making a new podcast and I'm just gauging interest. And what well, you were the first one to email me about it. That's why you're the first one on this podcast. Nice. But that, that thread just exploded. And within something like three days, I had 50 emails, Whoa. which is cr crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm booked until October right now. Jeez. Wow. I'm, I'm honored that I get to be the first one then. Nice. Thank you. Jeez. <laughs> hey, well, you are the OG, Charles. <laughs> the OG, episode one. So congratulations on that. Um, Charles, where can people find you on social media? We know you can find you on threads. Um, um, what's your handle there? Um, well, give me just a moment. I've got all this written down somewhere. Ah, um, so it's uh, threads.net mm -hmm. um, at arcblade.c.a.house it's yeah it's my it's arcblade with my author handle and i also um i'm on i've got facebook i mean basically if you search legend of the defiler you can mm -hmm. find my uh, author's page on there mm -hmm. um i think you know on reddit uh, i've got an account there that i engage a lot with my book um it's uh archblade 7777 and those are really the only ones that matter. I mean, I've got an Instagram and a TikTok, but they're mm -hmm. I I I I I'm I'm like I'm almost forty, so I barely even know how to do anything with those. So, <laughs> hey man, I'm fifty one, and I barely know what's going on. Oh, there you go. Too, yeah, so you're so. in good company here. Yeah, I got a few years on you, <laughs> but all right. So, um, if you send me all those links, I'll put them in the show description, so Ooh. anyone who listens to this will be able to to visit them. I will definitely do that. Fantastic. 
Charles, it's been wonderful talking to you. I really enjoyed reading your book. I didn't get a chance to say that I devoured it in probably a couple days. I, I then, was surprised. I, when, I, when I told you, yeah, I'd like you to read my book. Next thing I know, you've got all this stuff. And I was thinking, wow, this guy reads super fast. Well, I, I move quickly on stuff like this. And I, I wanted that. to get this out. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I did a, a second read where I was remembering specific parts of it. But yeah, I highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. There's a lot going on there. And once again, thanks for being on. And um, I wish you all the success in getting your book out there and all the success as an author. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure and we'll talk soon. You betcha.